Good morning. Good morning, and thank you all. And say, you're a better dressed bunch than usual. <laughs> and what brings that about? I think before we say anything else, Paula, welcome back. God bless you. We're very happy to see you back. You know, some call the Senate the most exclusive club in the world. An insightful remark, I think, to the extent that it suggests the sense of the camaraderie that the Senate at its best so often displays. There's nothing truly exclusive about the Senate, or the House for that matter, or the White House. On the contrary, the will of the people always seems to have a way of making itself felt, and decisively so. Take tax reform. In recent months, there were moments when I think all of us would have been tempted to paraphrase Henny Youngman and say, take tax reform, please. <laughs> and all that's changed. What happened when tax reform re was moved to the Senate? Something of a miracle took place. Bob Packwood and the others on the Senate Finance Committee had learned from what happened in the House. And Bob, you correct me afterward if I'm wrong, but I believe that you concluded something like this. If marginal rates were set too high, every lobbyist in Washington would insist on retaining deductions. Well, and if that were the case, then maybe America itself was telling Washington that marginal rates had to be kept down, way down. So you lowered them dramatically, eliminated deductions, and reported your bill out of committee by the astonishing margin of 20 to 0. Quite apart from tax reform itself, this represents a political triumph. After the loss of faith in government that took place during the 70s. In recent years, commentators have begun to say kind words about the institution of the presidency, and now you're demonstrating that the Congress, too, retains a vital aptitude for political initiative. In helping to restore faith in our fundamental institutions, you deserve the gratitude of the nation. As this historic tax bill moves to the floor, I stand with you in wanting to see the package win the support of the entire Senate something else, something perhaps of even greater importance. I'm committed to keeping this issue bipartisan, and I hope you all are. Tax reform is simply too important and, frankly, too fragile to be used by anyone for short-term political gain. So I urge you to act on this bill in a spirit of unity and with all reasonable speed. There's no reason the triumph in the Finance Committee cannot become a triumph for the country itself from a top personal income tax rate of 70% just five years ago to a top rate of only 27% from a complex and cumbersome tax code to a sweeping simplification from a tax system that discourages initiative and innovation to one that encourages lasting economic growth. I've said, as you know, on a number of occasions that last April 15th when they brought me my tax form already made out and all I had to do was sign it, I looked at it all completed and still didn't understand it. And now I'd like to ask Senators Dole, Byrd, Packwood, and Long to say a few words. Bob? Senator Byrd indicated other agencies are out of money. 
but tax reform is the number one priority. It'll be back in the Senate floor. I think uh, Senator Packwood has indicated this will get members uh, today, tomorrow, and the weekend to take to read the little volume they all have, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hopefully be prepared on Monday to stay on the tax bill until it's finished. So, Mr. President, we thank you for your leadership. There were times when the tax bill was essentially dead. Uh, I can recall, I think, one meeting in the Finance Committee where we did everything but pronounce it dead, and then the Bob Packard and his wisdom went back and tried a radical new approach. And it, here, here's a piece of legislation that went from the immovable to the unstoppable in a period of uh, two or three days. So we uh, thank you very much for inviting us, and I can indicate that on our side, it's going to remain bipartisan. There are a few, uh, few people around, uh, see Al over there and Al Camano. Others are worried about IRIS and things, and of course there will be amendments offered, maybe some will be adopted, but overall I think the bill is going to be pretty much intact. Well, Mr. President, I uh, say on behalf of all of my colleagues in a very bipartisan fashion that we thank you for your hospitality and having us out to this very good uh, breakfast. Uh, may I say also, too, that there should be no concerns about this being a bipartisan uh, effort. I was born in the administration of Woodrow Wilson, and he was the first president to begin uh, a process which carried on through uh, Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy, and now through Ronald Reagan. I believe I have to say that, Mr. President, you're the first Republican president that I can remember who ever really got behind tax reform. <laughs> and I, uh, and I, I congratulate you on, on that. But uh, you need have no fear about this bill passing the Senate, and it will have uh, the very strongest bipartisan support. Bill Bradley and uh, uh, our Senate has been championing tax reform, a broader base and lower rates for years, and uh, the House has already, of course, passed a tax reform bill, but you got out there and championed it, championed it uh, over the country, and you're to be congratulated. But it came out of this committee by a vote of 20 to nothing. Every Republican and every Democrat on that committee voted for it. And under the leadership of Bob Packwood, the chairman, and Russell Long, the venerable former chairman and now ranking member, all of those uh, members rallied uh, behind it. It's going to pass the Senate. There will be some amendments offered. They may be adopted. They may not be adopted. But that's the legislative process, and I think we have to expect it. But. Uh, those who may have feared a filibuster, as I said yesterday, there's a biblical passage which says, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. So there's nobody talking, <laughs> nobody talking about filibustering that bill. Just one final note, and that is that I uh, remember back in 1927 seeing the headlines about Lindbergh and his uh, flight to Paris. And the story began by saying something to the effect that Lindbergh flew over New York City at a terrific speed of 100 miles an hour. Well, this bill uh, came out of that committee at the <laughs> terrific speed of 100 miles an hour, and I'll be very much surprised if it doesn't pass the Senate 100 to nothing. Thank you. <laughs> well, folks, what can I say other than I am very very proud of the Senate, clearly from the statements yesterday, bipartisan statements, liberal statements, conservative statements from, from all wings and all philosophies, this bill is going to pass. I'm fully aware of the problem of the IRS that many of you have mentioned and the variety of solutions that some of you have suggested coming up to solve it, although I've yet to f hear a solution that I think on balance would get the votes to, to pass. I don't know. But apart from that, you're all well aware there's not another serious political problem in the bill, not capital gains, not the ITC in terms of the trade-off for the lower rates. And when this bill passes, and it will, this body can be so damn proud of what we have done. And the momentum is with us, and there's plenty of parents to claim credit for the momentum, whether it's the President or Bradley Gephardt or Kemp Kasson or a hundred others who've been pushing this idea, including Treasury One. There's plenty of parents. 
But when it goes to conference, it's going to be the Senate bill. And the momentum is so great, and the rates are so sacred, including the corporate rate, as far as I'm concerned, that we're going to win this in conference, and we're going to win it big. And it's going to be to our credit in the Senate and our glory, and we don't get that opportunity very often. Mr. President, members, many years ago, I appeared on a panel discussing a flood control project in Louisiana. Seventeen speakers, and since I was the ranking person there, they saved me for last. <laughs> when I got started making my speech, some fella got up in the rear and said, why don't you just shut up? It's all been said before. Before I could finish my speech, he's back on his feet again. What you're saying now has been said ten times. Why don't you just shut up? Sit down. Well, I managed to wind the speech up in a hurry. The, the mayor was a perfect toast. He said, Russell, don't you get upset about what that man said. That man doesn't mean a word of that. He is the town idiot. All that man is doing is just repeating what people around him are saying. <laughs> now, Mr. President, there's no point in me saying this is a good bill. I think I should say that, that, that I've been on the Senate Finance Committee for 33 years. And this is the best piece of fiscal legislation I've seen reported by the committee in 33 years. There's a dear friend of mine, a Court of Appeals federal judge who I thought was the best tax lawyer in Louisiana, recently wrote me a letter about this bill after we voted to report it. And that's what he said. He said, this is the best piece of legislation that any committee of the Senate has reported in tax terms uh, as far back as that man could recall, and he's in my age bracket. The bill will definitely pass. When you can report a bill by unanimous vote out of the Senate Finance Committee, my impression is, from my 33 years' experience, they can't keep you from passing the bill. I thought I will let you get it before the Senate. It's before the Senate. So the bill will pass. Uh, as Bob Bird predicted, it might well pass by a margin of 100 to 0. I think that would be a great thing if it did. It would be a great credit to all those who have labored in this vineyard. I, for one, have been trying to get rates down for 33 years since I went on the committee, back when it was 90 percent, 92, two years later. Mr. President, I've been trying to get rates down uh, on that tax law uh, since you were playing football for Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it remained up till now to get them down where they ought to be, to 27 percent. And I hope very much that this initiative in the Senate, uh, thanks to Bob Packwood, to make this a top rate of 27 percent, can remain a part of this bill. Uh, because I don't think anything will appeal to the American people as much as a broader base and a lower rate. And if we can get it there and keep it there, I think it would be a great credit to everybody who had anything to do with it. Thank you very much. Well, now, we have a few minutes. I know we're running a little late, but we have a few minutes here that maybe the floor is open for some questions or something. I can anticipate one maybe. I had it already from some of your colleagues on the plane yesterday, and that is, did I have any tips about for television? And, <laughs> yes, I have a couple. That is, learn your lines, don't bump into the furniture, and in the kissing scenes, keep your mouth closed. <laughs> Uh, maybe. <laughs> Anyone have yeah. anything on? Yes. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, when is uh, Mr. Gorbachev going to stop waffling about a summit? I don't know. He has sent sur surreptitious messages that he wants the summit, but uh, so far the date has not been set. And uh, in view of all of this, we're we're a little fearful having suggested a date once and immediately they felt there ought to be another date and the one they suggested was impossible. So uh, we're kind of feeling our way as to how we get around to saying, well, okay, when? But uh, we're hopeful that, that uh, maybe when the election is out of the way before the end of the year when we can have that. But he has expressed to 
in different ways that he really wants to have the summit. I've got to find out something, too, about him. Someone who's a master of the Russian language was in the office the other day, and before I could say his name, they said his name, and I found out that if they're right and they understand Russian completely, uh, we've all been wrong in the pronunciation because they were pronouncing it Gor Gorbachev instead of Gorbachev. So uh, I'm going to see if I can't find another Russian and pin it down <laughs> as to whether uh, <laughs> just which one is the right pronunciation. One problem we've got is the fiscal side, and I just saw a story last week, as you probably did in the Wall Street Journal, that says that the deficit for this year is going to be higher than the deficit last year. So we're still up above the $200 billion deficit range. And if you look at the, the Senate budget package and the House budget package, we're now in conference and we're working on that, they both have a revenue component. And I know you feel strongly you know, to the contrary on that. But one of the concerns that I think many of us have is, is the tax change, once we pass this bill, is this going to leave us with a worse deficit problem further down the line? We're having a hard time getting estimates on that. But in any event, um, I, I think it would be worth our while, not necessarily in this setting, but before we finish this tax bill, to make sure we haven't made the deficit problem worse. And I'm, I'm concerned about it, and I just raised it. I don't think we have with this bill, and I would like to call to your attention that every tax program back over the years that has resulted in lower rates has also resulted in increased overall revenues for the federal government, simply due to the fact of more incentive uh, produces more effort and thus more money upon which to pay taxes. But the um, I, I think, frankly, we still have not done all we should to come to meet the problem, which is excessive spending. And we've got to still deal with that if we're to stay on this pattern of a declining deficit to the point of a, of a balanced budget. And I think it's essential that we stand together and get that, get that done. But um, I am confident that we're going to see as a result of this tax program, it's a thing that everyone hesitates to make a projection about. But I am convinced that if we look at what happened in the last one, uh, the 1981 tax program, that we're going to see a further stimulant to the economy that's going to be from top to bottom if this program is passed. Someone else? You mean none of you have ever sat around and said, geez, I'd like to ask that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what? No? <laughs> well, well, if there aren't any, then uh, I'll, um, I'll just switch to a subject here and go without uh, waiting for answers or giving answers. It's a second vital issue, an issue you've scheduled to deal with this very afternoon. Each of you knows that the Middle East is tremendously complicated, that it's not just a question of Israel against the Arab states, but that the Arab states themselves are divided between moderate and radical nations. American influence in the region, I think, is absolutely vital to world peace. If, we're continue, if we continue to be seen by them and held up as just simply an ally and friend of Israel, unable to be fair with regard to uh, their problems on the other side, then we have no leverage at all. Our proposed arms sales to Saudi Arabia will increase the Saudi's ability to withstand the threat from radical Arab states. It'll in no substantive way disrupt the balance of power between Israel and the Arab world, and just the opposite. By making the region more secure, it will make Israel more secure. And for the sake of our own national interest and of security in this vital region, indeed for the sake of world peace itself, I ask you to permit the arms sale to go forward. The, I, I know that there are some things and, but, that are visible and that you think and, think and say about the Saudi Arabias. On the other hand, in the area of diplomacy, there are some things that just should not be talked about. They've got a political problem with the radicals in their own midst and the radical Arab states around them. But I can only tell you that they have been most supportive 
in a, in a quieter way, and uh, they cover it with these other things they say for an obvious reason, but they have been supportive, and we have had for more than 40 years now a relationship and an agreement, mutual security agreement with the Saudi Arabians, and it has been beneficial to both of us. And so I repeat, I hope that we can make this go through. First of all, they're going to have arms, whether we do it or not. But when they have them from us, there are restrictions on their use of them, and that they are restricted to using them defensively, or then there are things that we will do in return. But there's now one final matter on my mind, and it's a matter of giving honor where honor is due. Russell Long was elected to the United States Senate in 1948. And almost four decades later, in early 1907, he will, 87, he will retire and go back home to Louisiana, the state he loves so deeply and has served so well. For 15 years, Russell, you served as chairman of the Finance Committee, dominating that body by dint of your intelligence and utter mastery of its subject matter. Political scientists have found it difficult to place your economic beliefs to find a unifying thread in the positions that you've taken. Well, it's simple. Russell Long believes that society is best served when people work for their income, when there exists a clear connection between effort and reward. And by clinging to this view, Senator, you've done your state and the nation immense service. Four decades in the Senate. Russell, that's a fifth of the entire life of our nation. Four decades of relative peace and peace that you helped to keep. Four decades of economic growth and growth that you championed. Four decades during which you worked to keep the United States strong and good and free. And so on behalf of a grateful nation, I commend the Senator's Senator. And Russell, I have a presentation to make if you'll join me up here. <clears throat> That's about coming here this morning. I'm glad I came. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, Russell, I hope you'll convey that message once more if the amendment tree starts getting filled up. <laughs> I'm sure you all read it and you all know, don't tax you and don't tax me. Tax that fellow behind the tree. That's conveyed there. Well, this may be the only nation on earth where a hundred people of such different viewpoints can sit down to breakfast in a spirit of goodwill and agree to work together. I value your political skills, your friendship perhaps even more. So I won't send you a bill for breakfast and thank you and God bless you all. <laughs>